All right. Hey. Good. So welcome. Hey. I'm Vivian Maria, and we are live here. And before I go on uh, into our conversation with my very special guest in this wonderful rendezvous with two amazing people, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, introduction. They're, you know them well, but of course, we're going to give uh, a little uh, information on them. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, actor-director Matt Dillon. As an actor, some of his films include The Outsiders, Drugstore Cowboy, there's something about Mary and Academy Award winner for Best Picture Crash. As director, you can enjoy his first film, which was the 2002 narrative feature, City of Ghosts. Now, he just premiered recently his second film and his first documentary, El Gran Feyove, which will be a big part of our conversation tonight. And uh, up next, I'd like to uh, introduce to you now uh, someone who is overseeing this project as co-producer, Joel Truda, a multi instrumentalist, band leader, music producer, DJ, record collector, and in more recent years, a hemp health advocate. Then from Los Angeles, Joey's 40-year career has brought him into work and association with such luminaries as Seu Jorge, Screaming Jason. Hawkins, Bo Dinkley, Sugar King Paris, Tom Waits, Joe Strummer, Ernest Rangi, and so many other icons of music. And uh, speaking of icons, tonight we are going to be connecting from three different points from New York City, from Oregon, and from Miami to celebrate music, friendship, and the life and legacy of a Yove, who a day like today. It's his birthday. He would have been 97 years old. So, yeah. welcome, Joey and Matt. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks, Vivian. It's great to see you again. Likewise, my God, what a beautiful rendezvous. 2013, the year that Fe that Feyove passed away, was the last time that uh, that we were able to uh, see each mm. other, the three of us together. You know, so yeah, uh, have you here? Wow. Yeah. Well, it's great to be on the show, and uh, it's great to see Joey. We're, we're on a radio show here. He's in Oregon, and we're all in different points, as you said. And uh, but I, it was, as soon as I saw you, I was like, "Oh wow, this is a reunion!" You know, it was so nice. And the only guy missing was Albertico Menendez, that great yeah. uh, musician who was there, who recently died, but was was really great. I know. Uh, I know. We lost him recently, a few months ago, a couple of months ago. But and I know that also. When, and we'll be talking about the film because uh, many of these great musicians, many of them have passed away. Uh, mm. Of course, uh, but I guess I want to, you know, and this is going to be very much like having our cafecito or your favorite drink kind of conversation. And the viewers will also do the same as we enjoy this conversation and some music and talking about the documentaries. So I guess if we can go first into talking a little bit about. For those listeners and viewers who are here who might have heard the name or who might be a younger generation who might not know, let's talk about Peyote. Well, you want me to start? or Yeah, or, where do you want to start? I mean, let's, we, well, let's start back in October 7th, 1923, in Barrio Cologne. That's where he was born. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you end up. I didn't know any of that stuff when I accompanied Joey while he was making the record with Feyove back then. And we didn't have that much information on him. And I think, I, I, and I can speak for myself, but I think Joey were both in agreement that we, we had the music. That's all we had. And we loved it, you know? And the music was great. But we didn't have that much, I didn't have much information on him. You know, we kind of knew that he was part of the feeling movement. No, then, I haven't heard of the feeling movement at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the stuff we kind of, it's yeah, a good point. It, 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 kind of got labeled from feeling called Latin jazz. I grew up, I grew up with people like Cal Jader's music and mm -hmm. people I knew played in Cal Jader's band, mm -hmm. but I never heard of feeling. In fact, mm -hmm. I've been listening to the Cuban Jam Session records for mm -hmm. some years, for over 10 years, yes. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that the one song that I always loved to DJ with was Cimarron. Oh. I didn't know that, that was Feove. A classic. We, I was listening to Feove's record that Matt found his first album from 
like 1956 or so, right? And he taped the record. This is all in the film. Mm-hmm. And I'm listening to this record, and I still didn't make the connection that it was the guy from the Cuban Jam Session albums, yeah. and that uh, he wrote a great many of those tunes. He wasn't credited for these. Everyone else was. Uh, in the past year or so, these records got remastered beautifully and repackaged and extensive liner notes about the whole thing as a box set, right? There's five mm-hmm. albums. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that aspect of it, Matt? I mean, that's kind of yeah. how me well, and the well, you know, thing Afro-Cuban music was those records and mm-hmm. Cal- being brought up in California because it came from Cuba to Mexico to California, which is the same place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the word discarga, right? For example, uh, according to Leonardo Acosta, right, who's a great uh, was. Uh, an- another one, again, no longer with us, but exactly. was one of the great voices and uh, historians of Afro-Cuban jazz. And he also had a musical background. He was a musician. And he said that the word discarga, mm-hmm. and he describes it quite well in, in the film. He says it's it's just, it's it's to discharge. We kind of knew that, but mm-hmm. but he said that it was born out of the feeling movement. So the idea of the, of the Cuban jam session um, he, he talked about, like, early on, us jazz musicians would mingle with the songwriters, the, the feeling guys, you know, who are primarily guitar players and piano players, songwriters, and people like Feove who played a bu- bunch of instruments. They're creative guys, and they would mix together, and that's where these things, would, they would have these uh, kind of gatherings and apartments. They weren't performances in nightclubs. They weren't in bars in the beginning it really was these guys getting together and creating you know and he said it was probably the word probably came from jose antonio mendez Correct. because he was he was always coming up with, with words. words and ideas yeah. <laughs> right how about we talk about you know let's let's give people that are tuning in here who don't know any of this a little context descarga is referring to small group jam session also <laughs> So back in those days in in Havana, especially uh, just like New York City with bebop, you have people that were in big bands, like 18, 20 piece big bands that are playing arranged compositions every night, but then afterwards they're going to different places and they're jamming with each other, uh, you know, improv- more loose and impro- improvisational than their set written parts that they have to read and, and execute and express every night in, say, the Benny Goodman Orchestra, Count Basie, Ellington. They're getting together in small groups. Well, they were doing this uh, paralleling what we were doing uh, at the same time in the 40s and the 50s. But, in- jo- Joey, in- back to what, your experience... When you first got together with Feovi, it started with the jam session. Oh, it did. It did, of course. But the feeling, like most people don't know what we're talking about here either. Feeling, like let's give them a little bit. Would you like to tell them? Well, feeling, you know, you know, uh, it's true, Joey. We were talking about that. The feeling thing I really discovered when I was down there. I mean, Joey really. You know, the interesting thing is I'm the one who said, hey, Joey, what about this cafe? I learned more about Afro-Cuban music from Joey than he ever, than I ever taught him anything. I mean, really, he's a really, Joey's really knowledgeable and makes it enjoyable to learn about music so that we have that, that's our relationship and our friendship sort of came together on our mutual love of this music. Mm -hmm. And, but of course, when I got down there, Joey was busy making a record. That was his focus. Yeah, that's I was, how it was plan that things were so spontaneous that things were turned around because you're thinking, could I could I do something to cover this amazing singer? Yeah. And then Joe all we knew it. was all we knew were the records, you know, in a way. I mean, and and they were incredible. I mean, I I don't know about you, Joey, but they went to the top of the canon for me when I heard Feo. Oh, yeah. They went right up there to Arsenio and yeah. Arcanio. And yeah, Benny Moore. He went right up there. We didn't. He he didn't stop at the you know in the middle floors, man. He was no. he went right to the top in my estimation. That was you know, my top esteem. of the play, top top of the the you know top of the stack. And you know I, I have to say you know you mentioned uh, you know 
that I was a big influence on you in music and collecting. And like, just to give people a little bit more background here, when I met Matt, he was already collecting a lot of different genres of music, but one of them was Latin music and primarily the things that were found in Manhattan, like Tito Puente or, you know, anything that was like New Yorican and Boogaloo or uh, Joe Cuba. 50s mm -hmm. stuff, 50s, 60s stuff, but I gave him a short list of things of Cuban stuff. He said, hey, what are things I should look out for? And here's what happened. And this is mm -hmm. about the friendship and people that collect music together. You, he, he was in a place where he could find a lot of this stuff a lot more than where I was in California. So Matt started finding uh, huge amounts of these artists that I was telling him about, like uh, Chapotin, Chocolate y su estrella, Estrellas, um, Estrella, so who else? You know, Arsenio Rodriguez, like these people, like he was bringing me things I would never otherwise have heard. And it was still back before, like, right, when CDs are coming in, and yeah, a lot of things are coming together, but, mm -hmm. you know, you can only find this stuff, maybe, like, some of it we find in the Subway record shop, right. which was the record I store. used to go right. down, and yeah. poor Harry Sepulveda, man, I mean, they never had air conditioning in that place. Yeah. And I'd be down there going, hey, what about this? And this poor guy was like, oh, not this guy again, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I go down there and start sweating him about, hey man, what about something that sounds more like this, you know? And I'll remember, always remember this though. You went to a on a trip to Cuba. You used to go there kind of frequently, and you brought back one record called "This Is Feeling." Was the title yeah. of the record, and it was by uh, the trumpeter uh, Tellez, Samuel Tellez. He's right. Yes, yes. really, really hip music. But yeah. Yeah. Still did. We were just finding out that feeling was some sort of movement or something. We didn't know that it was very yeah. big in bolero or songwriter form, uh, really. Uh, well, I think there's still a lot of. I would like to just say something now that I've done all this extensive research and interviewed all these people. You know, I think that feeling the one thing that now, you know, after. There were two w waves of feeling, right? There was the first one. And the first one was what Feove was a part of. That was Feove and Jose Antonio Mendez and Luis Yanez and Jorge Mason and all these people. And they were, it was about jazz. It was about American songbook. And that was their thing, man. They were not. And then later, it became more like this cocktail music bolero and that was what it was but early on feeling definitely had a lot more of a jazz influence and i think and i think it's important to remember that i think because when you in fact they were songwriters they were part of a, a collective of guys and they wrote songs and they and they and, and the name of the, they they started a publishing company because they had no they had they had no money and they were maybe they were getting screwed over maybe not but they were not being well taken care of so they decided to start their own publishing it was called music havana and music havana the output of songwriting was incredible by those guys jorge samora he wrote so many great songs he's known as a comedian yes feove jose antonio mendez and none of these people were recognized until much later and they weren't they weren't uh it, so when feeling is yeah, it's influenced by jazz. It is it is the mix of Cuban music and jazz, but it's not the same thing as like Chano Pozo and Chico Farrell and Machito mixing right. with the jazz guys in New York. They were it was more professional. It was more musician oriented. Where the feeling thing was a little more songwriter, a little mm -hmm. more songwriter based. Right. And, and, and but that early period, it was really it, they were doing jam sessions. It was jazz oriented. And so that's why I think sometimes people look at Feover and go, well, was feeling, was he part of it? He was a part of it. He was there at the very beginning of feeling. We're talking about 40s, 50s, you know, and then. Yeah, you know, 40s. 40s, 50s, the, the jam sessions were happening where musicians normally were, you were 
singing just a singer, and maybe the pianist do a solo, but then here we have the trombonist, and then you have a Negro Vivar doing the trumpet solos, or, you know, Pucho Escalante, I mean, all kinds of things that, that uh, Generoso Jimenez, so all these things that, you know, were new to people, and I remember Cachao told me when he did the jam sessions at the Escaris in Miniatura, I remember he mentioned to me, I remember when we finished those escargas, it was like four or five in the morning, and we had to come out with an armor because we didn't know if people were gonna be taking it well <laughs> or they're gonna be throwing rocks at us, you know, because it was really? so innovative, just like wow. Feyoli. Wow, seriously, huh? I mean, that's amazing because it's uh, that record you're speaking of, uh, Descargas in miniature for many mm -hmm. people here in the States, they this is a desert island disc. Yeah. This is something right. that, you know, and, uh, you know, the band leader, Rudy Regalado, he's Venezuelan, he's, he's passed uh -huh. off for years, but he was uh, in L.A. for years, and he had a, the Feove's second record. He showed it to me, and it was missing the cover, and half of it was broken <laughs> off, okay? Like, you couldn't I listen to the first three songs. You could only listen to the second three songs on each side. He said because he got into a fight at a party when that record was new. <laughs> <laughs> and someone broke it, and they almost like they got it off, like almost got a fist fight over this because it was people were really certain people were really agitated, almost like when punk rock was new. That's right. how the impact this had, where people just were like very uncomfortable with how modern this was. Correct, and I think for you, uh, you know, same thing. He was an innovator, who was a pioneer, and people were not ready for him. His genius right. mind and, and way of singing and performing. Some people like you, you know, in the documentary call him crazy because the way he moved and everything, but it's his style. He was a drum from the head, you know, the feet to the, to the head. And yeah. 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 He was, he was really from uh, Cologne was a, was a, was a rough neighborhood, but mm -hmm. it was the neighborhood. I mean, he literally grew up, I mean, he's, he was much younger than Chano Pozo, but he grew up about half a block away from there. And there's the Salon, Los An uh, Salon, uh, California. Uh, Sol uh, no, I'm saying Solar, California. Like Salon, I think Salon, Los Angeles, is in that club <laughs> in Mexico City. But Solar, yeah. California was was a real. In fact, there's a guy that we met there. His name was Yeo, and he was beautiful, beautiful man. Uh, who was an old rumbero from the neighborhood, and he said, "I remember Feover when he was a little boy because he was." six or seven years older than Feo. Mm -hmm. That's how old this guy was. Wow. And in the middle of the solar is a giant sabo tree. You know, what is it? It's a, how do you say it's sabo, I think. Uh, it's a, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a tree that's that's a very sacred tree in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Seba, I think. Seba. Uh, okay. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble because I'm not saying it right. But this tree, he remembers when it was small. He, he said, oh, my gosh, really? And he said, I remember it was a little tree. And now he was walking around it. And the tree was this enormous tree with the roots dropping down. And he was saying, I remember what it was, just a little tree. And, <laughs> you know, he said to us in the interview, he said he remembered Feove and his brother. He said, everybody in the neighborhood played rumba. And he said Feove was particularly inventive and funny in his style and the manner in which he played. And, and then he said, you know, I'm 96 years old. God willing, I'll make it to 100. And that's in the film. But, you know, we went back and he made it to 100. And I ran into his daughter and she said he died. But he did make it to 100, you know, which was kind of beautiful. And But he could really, he could. He talked about Chano Pozo. Like, Chano Pozo, oh, mi amigo mio. Amigo <laughs> mio. There was this good friend. They would play rumba, you know. So wow. really interesting. It was one of the, I think it was a real privilege for me to be able to go and it was it was a lot of work putting the film together, but it was a real privilege to talk to a lot of these folks and and give voice to their experience mm -hmm. in their lives. You know, so we yeah. go out there what the film is like for people that are tuning in, wondering what are we talking about here. Yes, I well, mean a lot of people are circulating. A lot of people know, but there's probably okay. people. Let me try. Let me try, it. Joey. I'm going to start with you because it starts with you. Okay? OK, we wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for you. OK, and I want to say that Joey is remarkable in terms of his uh, he's looking at things differently and musically. And he has a great appreciation for Joey, if I don't mind me speaking about you in front of you in this way. Uh, but uh, an appreciation for 
mm -hmm. uh, music in a very deep way. And a lot of the, the, the music that he recognizes from another time. And so, you know, I knew this about Joey. I knew about the projects he'd done with Les Baxter and stuff. He'd done with Mongo Santa Maria and the guys from Studio One. So when I came across Feove, and this was really, and how did I come across Feove? It was through a guy called Guapacha. When I heard Guapacha, who was a I'm scat singer. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, yeah, fantastic scat singer, very mm -hmm. much in the style of Feove. In fact, he was a friend of Feove's. Mm -hmm. and, and I just knew this was that Joey would like Feove because of the same, we, I knew Joey's taste. We had similar taste in music mm -hmm. and a bebop, scat, Latin with Afro-Cuban. I mean, it was, it was ideal mm -hmm. for him. So I suggested to him that he do something with Feove because I knew he was living in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And because this is the kind of thing he did, you know, and, and, and much to my surprise, he came back and said to me, Hey, guess what? I'm doing the record. You know, I'm good. I put together a group. I've been going back and forth to Mexico and he'd done it, you know, and I thought that was fantastic. And then we had, we talked about like, you know, maybe I could go down. Of course, I was thrilled about the idea of going down to record this. And uh, we had another mutual friend, uh, Drew Carolyn, who, who I had directed a couple music videos before mm -hmm. with. And we went down, we tailed Joey. He was down there weeks before us, but we came afterwards and we tried to kind of stay back a little bit, not get in the way too much while they were rehearsing and preparing the record. Of course, mm -hmm. I did get in the way because Feovi was like, hey, he's a very nice boy. This, mm -hmm. this guy, who's, he couldn't remember my name. And this kid, Mateo, is very nice, but he's really disrupting the rehearsals, you know. Mm -hmm. He thought I was like one of the cable wranglers in the, in the, in the video <laughs> crew, you know. It was Dad Millen. <laughs> so he was, you know, it was it was great. So we had this experience for me. First, I think to be filming these rehearsals was great. And the energy, I think, that was, was terrific during the rehearsals. And to be able to capture that. We only had one camera. It was at a time when people were still using, I mean, like mini, mini uh, HD cassette, you know, recorders and we were a small crew um mm -hmm. but i think what would be good is for joey to talk a little bit about the rehearsal process and working with feovi because i can tell you this the chemistry between he and feovi was special that and that's evident i'm pleased to say in the film that yeah. it's really beautiful to see the, the two of you guys together it's really yes beautiful. yes mm -hmm. and, and I Go ahead and say things. And while you're talking, I might be putting up a couple of images that I know that are part of the. And some of them, in fact, we have uh, with us uh, uh, Jacobo Brown. I mean, we'll, we'll be talking about part of the personnel in the, just in the music, but the you know, great photographer and all the people involved. So, but I'll let you chat with our audience and then I'll play some. Music. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Matt, for everything you said, I appreciate it. It means a lot, of course, coming from you and coming from anybody. But, you know, we've had a, a long trajectory here for those of you who are tuning in or don't know the context. We've been friends for 26 years. We put together friends in 1994. And record collecting was our one of our main things. And honestly, what I want to say to that, it was yeah. the music. It, it was really the, was the music. And was there the are music. people that are just record collectors. No, this was really. about the music. This was about the music. It was like, and back then, everyone was making cassettes. And, you know, if you couldn't find that uh, tangible copy of a record, you would tape it from your friend. And you would listen to that tape till it wore out. Okay, I want to give a shout out to a great friend of ours named Filio, who's watching right now, who just said, she still has your Cuban junkyard cassette that <laughs> I copied for her. Matt used to make the best mixed tapes of the, the most greatest things that Kate, he felt would find in Cuba or New Jersey. But, you know, the trajectory here for me is like since I was a child, I would find records that uh, I would be fascinated with. And as I got older in, into my teens and adulthood, some of the people from those records materialized into my life and we became friends and we made music together. And some of these people were like uh, Al McKibben, Francisco Aguabea, 
mm-hmm. Sister Cocteau and Dodd, who was like the Barry Gordy of Jamaican music, a studio mm-hmm. one. Roland Alfonso, who created the Scatolites, Ernest Wranglin, a lot of Mongo Santa Maria, like people who I really like. It's almost an interesting, like a manifestation, if for lack of better terms, or like my my stories were right in there for how these people came out of the records. So, you know, Matt found El Wapacha, Al Borsello, right? That's his name? Amado Ar- Borsello. Uh-huh. Armado. Armado Borsello. Ar- he was with uh, Bebo Valdez Orchestra. He found this compilation album in Cuba and he it had two or three songs on it. He said, you got to hear this guy. And then, we, and then like there was the, uh, this is, was it We Got Rhythm? What is it? The the documentary that has. Oh, Cuba, yeah. With right? Chucho, Chucho playing piano. Right. Where it's like some of the early guys from Iraqeri, I think, before they mm-hmm. were Iraqeri playing behind. Yeah. Really behind good. El Wapachat. It's like blowing our minds. And so then we found Feolde. And, you know, to back up, just to kind of back up a little bit, I found the these Descarga and Latin Cuban Jam session records in 1987. Mm-hmm. And um, what happened was uh, at right in 1988, Mario Melendez is an all, a longtime friend of mine. He opened up a club in Los Angeles called the King King. And he appointed mm-hmm. me as the person in charge of all the music of hiring bands, of creating uh, bands that would play every single week. Uh, he needed, and he wanted interesting music, things that you were not going to find in all the clubs that, that were typical of the clubs at that point in L.A. And I started this Descarga night, and I really didn't know what I was doing. I was in my boot camp. It was for how I learned to play this music. And I remember there were certain people I would had asked if they wanted to participate that were already in the local like salsa bands, and they were like, "No one's gonna want to do that. No one's gonna want to go to that thing. No one like you know just you, you should just some forget about that." To Al Israel. And yeah, I mean, this thing after a while, it blew up to where like people like Victor Pantoja was a regular, Francisco mm-hmm. Aguilera was a regular. Um, yeah. and Time there was a band like Mongo or Tito Puente, uh, people would come, Papo Vasquez would come in and play, or the different people would come in that were visiting in town, and uh, Johnny Almendra. They, these people would come in and sit in with the, the group, and uh, the personnel rotated. But this is how, for five years, every single Tuesday, I started, I became more and more defined Eddie Resto, who was oh, Eddie, yeah. Mary, right? Hey, love he it. Yeah. Me and yeah. uh, he was with the Palmieri brothers and Machito and like every everybody of note in the 70s. He was a very young guy starting with these people that were older. He was Andy Gar- Andy Gonzalez's, uh, one of his students and protégés. He helped me. He helped me really put things together. Al McKibben mentored me. And so then I had the, the fine honor of being in the company of like Bobby Rodriguez many times. And uh, whenever I would see Tito Puente play, be able to speak with him and hang out with him and catch out many different times. And so this was like the trilogy of the Trinity of the, with Al McKibben who defined Latin mm-hmm. Afro-Cuban playing of the 20th century from mm-hmm. the forties, And so I didn't know that Descarga was something that Feove was a keystone figure in creating until 20 years after the fact or something. And so, Matt, we're jumping forward to Mexico City then in 1999. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, okay, 10 years later, I didn't know. And like, the, even the Cal Jader records I had, in the, in, you know, that were, were the old 50s Cal Jader records were based upon those Cuban jam session records. Even some mm-hmm. of the songs were the same, like Perfidia and things. But, um, you know, we were rehearsing for for the Feove album. And, you know, Feove was a, like a, a person who would do something different every single time. Uh, you know, he was so free in his expression and creativity that 
sometimes it was challenging to keep him back on track with the, the structure of an arrangement because he would want to go so far out that he would just like get lost in his own like <laughs> beauty. And, that, and he was always that way. Like in, if you look at the footage of him from the, the movie, the first film he did was the last Technicolor movie made in Mexico City. It was oh, called yeah. La, La Escuela de Rateros. De Rateros. Mm -hmm. and, and he is doing, he's doing a improvisational scat <laughs> to Hamakino. Oh, Hamakino. And you can see he's yeah. out of sync. He's out of sync. He's, yeah, he, not, he's yeah. not in sync. They probably did the recording right before they filmed. And, mm -hmm. and you can see in the background is, is Nino Rivera is playing upright bass, right? Really? And, oh. Yeah. And he starts to go, and his mouth is doing one thing in the vote. Uh -huh. because, because the guy could never do the same thing twice, right? He's so yeah. spontaneous, yeah. you know? And so to try to get him to do what he just did two minutes ago, it was never going to happen, right? He was, everything was fresh. He had to be free, right? I mean. True. I mean, his takes were so different uh, each time. And, you know, um, if you look carefully in that film clip at the very end, he's back, back in the audience part of the nightclub seat and he moonwalks. He does the moonwalk. You don't see his feet, but you see that he's going backwards. He's gliding backwards. He's like uh, doing the moonwalk. I mean, they were doing this, I think, in Harlem in the 20s, but it's not a Michael Jackson thing. Sorry to break the <laughs> you know, like Or even a James yeah. Brown thing, right? The only you people know? that do that is uh, Philo Bacallao with Orquesta yeah. in the 50s, Bacallao. and then Fayobe practically, yeah. but I really haven't seen that much more. Yeah, Fayobe did it, and I think yeah. Jacobo said that. He said, well, you know, Jacobo was like, he knew it from the Michael Jackson moonwalk, and he said, you know, it's Fayobe would say, yeah, but none of, nothing is like, it's all about how you interpret. Nothing is completely new. Everything is about how you re reinterpret it, you know? Yeah. And that, that really, that thing is just something that came from Africa, yeah. you know. Amazing, amazing. And we were talking about Jacobo, and I want to share a comment that he, I mean, so many beautiful comments of people, everyone's, you know, chiming in with beautiful notes. But Jacobo, he wrote, uh, thank you, the great project I have done, or done. Uh, that's Jacobo's, uh, you know, message here that I wanted to share because, you had such an amazing, I mean, and we'll talk about the musicians too, who are part of this amazing recording that is just priceless. Uh, and of course, we'll talk about behind the scenes. So Joey or Matt, we'll talk about, I know we have Osmani Paredes and Miguel Valdez, Celio Gonzalez, I mean, an icon, you know, of Cuban music since Sonora Matancera and all that, uh, Chocolate Armenteros. Tell me more about the, the personnel which combines the traditional musicians, you know, from yesteryear, of course, for you over, and the younger generation too, like Celia's son and everything. Well, Miguelo is, uh, he's commenting right now. I'm mean, actually, excuse me when I'm looking down, I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with people on our lives here. Thank just you. To, Let to me put Miguelo's comment. Miguelo, I'm you know, sure. right here. Saludos. Uh, and thank uh, you, Viviam. He says, <laughs> Era Miguel's comments. <laughs> yeah, he's great. Yeah. He was a great friend to Feobe right to the very end. Yes, and, you know, an incredible conguero and percussionist, bata player, and uh, you know, uh, we these were people that had come and lived. Part of the film is about how Cubans made it over to Mexico. Uh, mm -hmm before and after the revolution, but primarily in the film about before. But Miguel, oh, he's a young man. Uh, I think he was in his mid twenties, maybe 25 when we made this recording. And he had come over from Cuba uh, with Osmani Paredes, uh, Paredes, I'm sorry. And uh, who's a pianist, an extraordinary pianist. Maybe Miguel, could you list some of who the horn players were, the, tr the other trumpeters? There's two trumpeters. There's Reynaldo, who's since. Uh, uh, great uh, flautist, great flautist. Uh, yeah. Reynaldo plays on the flute, Alfredo Pina on the trumpet, right? Um, Thank you. Yes, yes. You've got the facts and figures right there. Yes. Yeah, well, you know me, Joey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So, you and know. Um, you know, 
So let's see. So we had Osmani Paredes on the piano and background vocals, Celio Gonzalez Jr., timbales and coro, Miguelito Valdez on the congas and coro, Joey Altruda, bass, producer, arranger of uh, most of the songs. I think it was only a couple uh, that Osmani uh, uh, arranged. We did some spectacular, a couple of spectacular modern Cuban style yeah. songs arrangements on the on the thing uh, on the album and these guys uh, aside from uh, Celio Celio grew up in in Mexico uh maybe was born there I believe yeah but I mean uh, yeah but these other people had played in Cuba they they lived in Mexico City I think uh Enrique Jorin was one of the bands they were in which is a major icon of danzón that's music. that's who Osmani came over with and, that's what and, came and, over with. Yeah, that's what we came to Mexico with was uh, the Horin group and the other guy, uh, Fa Fabian Garcia, right? He, he was the oh, bass player. Uh, he, of, bass player. He's and he's right. wonderful. He's in the film and he's lovely and he passed on, but he was the bass player on the, the last, the only, the recording that Faiobi did in 79 with Nino Rivera, with Mami Papi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was in the group with Osmani when they came to Mexico and he went back. And Joey, I've seen pictures with that guy when he showed me and, and you would have known a lot of the people because your friend Rudy Regalado was in that, was 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 with oh, wow. him and they were oh, friends. Wow. You know? uh -huh. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, yeah. These guys came from, but it's once again, these young guys that were on this album had come over and stayed in Mexico City. Now Osmani and Miguel, oh, they're both in New York City for a long time. They they got it, they came to the big big city and made it big in what their field is in the Afro Cuban world and jazz. It's so so inspiring to see their own personal trajectories as musicians, knowing how challenging it can be for. Anyway, well, you know, I mean, yeah. I, to that point, you know, that was the uh, journey that so many um, took was to go. Uh, so many Cubans first went to Mexico. And I think we think of because so many iconic figures like Machito and and uh, and uh, Miguelito Valdez, perhaps, and certainly Chano Pozo went directly to New York. But the, the, the journey often was Mexico and then the world, you know, and then the United States, obviously. Uh, you know, I think, and certainly uh, Mango Santa Maria went through Mexico first, you know, and Benny More was unknown in Cuba Correct. and yet a big star throughout Latin America before. Yeah, he went to the Matamoros, went to Mexico as well. So all of them, but I think it was also that great connection and a great conversation between Mexico and Cuba. In other words, there were a lot of Mexicans who would also go to Cuba and also uh, the Cubans would go to Mexico. So that was a beautiful, even for example, Perez Prado, who had many of the horn players were Mexican, many of the musicians. Yeah. That no, that's true. Amazing. Yeah, and I, I want to just say one other thing, a guy who's in the film and he's beautiful. I love him. Is Tino Contreras? He's a, oh, a yeah, trap drum him. player, Mexican. I mean, he's got a. Apparently, he's got this new hip record out, and I think he's got to be maybe mid nineties now. He's ninety four six. Uh, yeah, I got a message from him, and yeah. he loved Feove. Yeah, he loved. He loved Feove. Yes. He told yeah. me when he met Feove, and Feove said, "Man, you got to get me to Mexico. This is back in the fifties." And he said, "You want to go to Mexico? I want to stay here, man." He fell in love with Cuba, and all Feove we talked about was Jose Antonio Mendez and wanting to get to Mexico. So the, there was definitely this this current current going back and forth. And Dandy Beltran, who mm -hmm. passed away, was a wonderful guy, a great. I loved him very much. He was a Cuban singer who immigrated to Mexico. Jose Antonio Mendez was brought over by Feove was brought over by Jose Antonio Mendez, but the, another person who brought a lot of Cubans to Mexico was Tin Tan, the comedian, oh, yes, the Mexican yes. comedian. And he brought Dandy over and he brought, and he brought over also Jorge Zamora, Samorita. Oh, and the story that Dandy told, and I didn't get to put it in the film because there's only so much you can do, is he talked about the discrimination that existed at the time. It wasn't as pronounced as it was in North America, but it existed. And, and uh, 
the Dandy and Zamorita, who were both black, uh, were not admitted into a nightclub because of the because the color of their skin, and and this really angered really angered uh, Tintan, and he said to them, "I want you guys to come to Mexico because you're not going to experience this there. You'll be and and that and that." So Tintan is a very, very well regarded, I think, among those people who were exiled. He was a good man, and he really was, he was on the right side of things. And uh, but uh, you know they were back and forth a lot. There was another guy in the film uh, who was with a group called Trio Avalenio, and his name is Miguel Medina, mm -hmm. and he was a musician. And he told me, said, I remember Feobe singing in Cuba. He was Mexican, Trio Avalenio. It was a Cuban and Mexican trio. They were at the big radio station in Havana, CMA Cool. And he remembers hearing Feove sing, not in the radio station, washing cars on the street in front. But he heard that voice. And that's how desperate Feove was. He was playing for peanuts wherever he could. But the talent was always recognized. He was the guy that people... They recognized him and they never forgot him once they saw him, you know, his, mm -hmm. and that he took with him from childhood to the end, you know. Oh, I, see, to, well, go ahead. Oh, I just see some comments from Ileana Casanova, Casanova here on our Facebook feed that uh, other people that made it through Mexico were Candido, uh, Prado, Mariano Merceron, Kiko Mendive, which is kind of like, if, you are, if you're a heavy person in a the old 78s, you know what that is, but otherwise people like him are like kind of sadly lost in the annals. With the Silvestre Mendes, they were Kiko Another Mendes, great Silvestre person, Mendes. yeah. I mean, uh, I mean. Matt introduced, Con, uh, Matt uh, interviewed Condito, but it didn't make it into the film. I mean, there, there's like probably, we could make an entire YouTube yeah. channel on all the extras. Oh of course. We should Something like this that we wish made. I mean, sure it's available. such a great. Candido will be 100 years old in just in April. So he's one of the longer, you know, all Candido's a beautiful person, man. And yeah. he still plays. He still plays, takes care of himself. And, yes, uh, he does. Yes, he yeah. does. There's a lot of really great, um, a really a lot of great comments here. For example, Emiliano Diaz, uh, he's saying that he's impressed that Matt Dillon knows all these Cuban musicians and their stories. Good show. So we're getting all these, and you know, he's an actor. So we have, I mean, so many beautiful comments that are coming through. Uh, someone else is saying that a great interview. I appreciate music knowledge from the three of you. Make sure you hear Matt knowing so much about Cuban music and jazz. I miss Miami and touring with those bands. He's a trombonist, great trombonist from Miami, who's no longer here in Miami. Oh, wow. uh, Jacobo's is sharing that Miguelo, uh, Miguelito now has a feeling project these days, so we have to yeah. be on the lookout for that. Yeah, his band with his wife is called The Feeling Messengers in oh. New York. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Miguelito is amazing and he's an amazing drummer and I can tell you from the rumberos here in New York that I play rumba in New York around at venues and in the park hold him in the highest regard it's just a great rumbero from Cayo Hueso which is the neighborhood of real the hardcore rumba neighborhood Right. And but he told me something, and I want to go back to this because it brings us back to Feove. And one thing mm -hmm. about Mig Miguelito was he was there. He and Feove were had so much in common, you know. Both mm -hmm. of them, like Joey, born in October, right? He's got a birthday coming up. Joey, when is your birthday? I'm on the twenty second. Twenty second. Oh, yeah. October babies, right? But but well, you're a Scorpio like me. <laughs> yeah, you get the bite. You lost your man. Let's see. Oh, I don't know. He was a neighbor of Dandy Crawford. Can you guys hear me? I, I think I went out. My picture went out. I don't know. Right. But, but, but I'll just say really quickly that Dandy Crawford, he, he knew him from his neighborhood. And I thought that was incredible. Dandy Crawford is the one who really translated the word feeling from sentimiento. So when they would hear the song, they would hear the word feeling used in all these uh uh, American jazz numbers, and he was the one when they were like, what, what is this feeling? He said, Sentimiento. Mm. And he was 
maybe before Feove as a scat singer, the difference was that Dandy Crawford scatted, it was a beautiful singer, but in a more, in, in a way that was more North American, more in, yeah. the, in the style of Louis Armstrong or Louis Prima. Right. And Feove, what Feove did was he took it further and, 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 and Afro-Cubanized scatting. You know, that's where he was unique. And this young guy, uh, uh, this great scat singer, Guapacha, was a uh, protege of Feove's in a way. They were friends, but he was much younger than Feove. And he just wanted to be like Feove. And I, somebody told me that one time they saw them, and i tell you what it was. It was Jesus Blanco told me that he witnessed the three of them performing together on stage. Could you imagine wow. Dandy Crawford, Feove, and Guapacha, all of them scatting? Wow. Uh, performance. I can't even imagine. It must have been something. Well, we're missing Bobby Carcass says there to you know. Yeah. Well, Bobby Carcass says <laughs> is the great grandson, right? I mean, in a way. I mean, he is. Exactly. That's the lineage: Dandy Crawford, Feove, Guapacha, and Bobby Carcass says the great exactly. Bobby Carcass says is an enormous talent. And Joey, yeah. you're going to meet Bobby. You got to meet Bobby. Finally, yeah. you guys are like you got He's in the film spirits, kindred yeah. spirits. I've been to Bobby concert several times here in Miami, and just in a smaller setting in a big theater, he's just stupendous. You know, his full horn. He's also a showman. The great scatting plays piano, plays percussion. He's just so talented and very knowledgeable too of, of music. And of course, follow the lines of Fayola without a doubt. Uh, and and in the documentary, I know he's part of it and does beautiful comments about you know how important it is what you guys did with the documentary because of the books. There's very little said about Feyuve, you know, and that's, and, true. that's true. He's kind of a, he's a, someone who's too so cool that people didn't understand him, and so he exactly. doesn't get a recognition like say what Charlie Parker got or someone like as prophetic in his own way as someone like Charlie Parker at the same or Dizzy Gillespie, but he had his own his own. He's more like Babs Gonzalez. You know, I want to bring up another point. It was he came up in the golden age of, of television, right? That's when he really came to be. And at that time, television really for these feeling guys, they were they weren't uh, never really seen much on television, you know, and it was partially, partially because of discrimination that existed, existed certainly here in the United States. And it existed to some extent in Cuba. And not to say that they weren't, but television was a tough medium, and it's the medium that Feove needed more than anything was to be, he was a showman. He needed to have that. And Mexico, the door was wide open for that, you know? And so, um, you know, he's the first to say, you know, that, that, that didn't, really, didn't really click for me. I mean, he was writing songs. He wrote Mongo Mangue. Miguelito right. Valdez made it a hit. And it yes. was made a hit by others later on. And he wrote uh, Baila Meste Mambo, which was done by Quarteta de Aire, and many other songs and stuff well, Benny Moré recorded it. By uh, Olga Guillot, too, I mean, Boleros, everything. All these things. This is all before he is himself a recording artist. And when you see Feove and you see the dynamic uh, showmanship and the performance, you can't imagine that there was a period of time, like maybe if he stayed in Cuba, he might not have become, he might not have had the opportunity to do what he did because he was a, a natural performer and, and uh but it was really in mexico and it didn't take much didn't take him very long when he hit when he hit mexico he hit the ground running he was working immediately thanks to his friend jose antonio mendez he was working with the best musicians that were there and uh so it didn't take much i mean he was struggling in cuba but when he hit mexico it happened it happened immediately you know no, yeah. and Mariano uh, Garcia, so Mariano Rivera Conde, who immediately also saw the potential and the talent in this amazing man. And of course, here you have the RCA <laughs> main guy, the promoter of the big names, and gave him, in fact, uh, the name of El Gran Feyove, uh, which you yeah. know, is him very well. Yeah. But I think, you know, it's, it's important that he did that because he was a very important uh, producer uh, and, and, and someone who really catapulted yeah, uh, but it, you know, for all Feove's kind of bigger than life uh, persona, he was modest and he was always quick to point out 
it was a name that was given to him that he didn't give it to himself. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Well, you know, all of these people we're speaking about mentioning are in the film, either they're interviewed or there's an expose getting answered. So it's, it's a little more challenging just hearing these names dropped if you've never heard them and not even seeing photographs. But the person you were just mentioning, the A&R person, uh, Condi Silva, right? No, Ma Mariano Rivera Condi. Okay. He was the A&R exactly. man for RCA right. Victor. This guy. The star um, maker of Latin Fred America. Prado, Benny Morey, Agustin Lara, uh, yeah. uh, was uh, ne Negra. He was the star what maker. Yeah. Yeah. If he, uh, uh, Mariano Riquette Rivera Condi gave incredible. you the blessing. That was it. And Tonya La Negra, like right. superstars. This guy had his sense. He knew, and he got them all signed to RCA Victor, including El Gran Feove. He right. gave him the El Gran Feove. So this whole story is exposed, like put together by Matt, which took a long time to kind of do the detective work and find all this stuff out because we two guys are a couple of gringos that found <laughs> Latin music right. because we just it vibed with us so hard. We didn't know anything about it. Well, you know, when I was, when you were making an incredible detective yeah. story that um, keeps unfolding, you know? When, I mean? when Joey was in the middle, you know, under the gun, trying to get this record, you know, done in a, in a very short period of time, I would appeal to Faye and say, you know, listen, I really, if you have any, you know, old photographs, any sort of, thing I can use to sort of put the pieces together, you know, I'd appreciate it. And he, and he did give me something. It was about five color Xerox copies of record covers that I already had. And, you know, I, and I think it was just because, yeah, he had old pictures of himself. He had all that stuff. He had old letters. He had everything, but he just was not where his mind was at. He was a future thinking guy. When yes. his contemporaries were making, you know, doing Buena Vista social club type stuff, he wanted to do a rap record. He did techno music. He was a, he was like, hey, we got to, you know, and that was a paradoxical thing with him because as Joey can tell you, like he was always talking about like the youth have to learn from us old guys. But at the same time, he always wanted to do whatever was the new thing, you know, and, and that was a blessing and a curse for him, by the way. Yeah. I know, but he was in many ways. He couldn't help it. Yeah, no, he was a, always forward thinking. And, you know, uh, for those of you people out there watching who don't have a real context, this is a film about a man named Francisco Feove Valdez. Today would have been his 97th birthday. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about his friendships with people and my friendship with Matt and my friendship with him and how we all kind of came together. His story goes back to about 1940, creating what we have known for years here in the States is Latin jazz, taking American jazz, harmonic sensibility and scat singing and things and putting it with Cuban rhythm. And, you know, I, in the film, I talk about how the two of us mirrored one another because I came up in jazz and American music, loving Cuban music, having been brought up around the Banda brothers and Pancho Sanchez, who was then playing with Cal Jader when I was a teenager and my neighbor, Bobby Redfield, who was Cal Jader's guitarist. I mean, I, I found this music by happenstance in a certain way. I was kind of plunked down in that area of the globe right at that moment. But like I found Feove and we, we, we're looking at each other like, wow, this is a kind of a similar story. And we just, it just happened, you know, and uh, his, his story runs so deep and it has never been told. It's, there's not a book about this, like no. what they call feeling is Latin jazz. It's, you know, um, it, it doesn't I, I, exist. And, you know, uh, it's a different, it's a way more cosmopolitan presentation of Cuban music than something like Buena Vista Social Club. No. It's both are very high quality presentations, but this is way more cosmopolitan. Uh, this would be like bebop, and the well, other one would be more like. No, but Celio, wait, Celio, Celio Junior, Celio Senior said, "Yo soy campesino," right? 
Yeah. So he said, I'm a country boy. And, yeah. uh, you know, I want to just talk about that for a minute because it was a beautiful thing that when that recording that day, because Celio was retired pretty much. He was living in retirement. And he showed up to visit his son who was playing timbales. And, and, and Feove always relied on a coro backup singers and he didn't they weren't there you know it was going to be recorded after the fact i think joey and 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 Celio took it upon himself to he just walked across nobody said hey, Feobe, wait, Celio, would you help to, to, well yeah the, was, he just walked across the stage and went into the booth <laughs> and started right. singing with him it was beautiful oh yeah absolutely i mean because to just give a little context here in the in the lead singer of like Feove was, he's singing what's called inspiracion. It's an inspired improvisation over people singing a repetitive chorus. It's African. And so he, we were going to add the chorus parts afterwards. And so he had to sing a coro and be improvising in between back and forth. And so here comes Sergio Gonzalez from the, the, the booth, the control room. And he's like the Frank Sinatra of South America, okay? And he's like, my guy here needs some help with the coro. Let me go in there and give him a hand. And he got so inspired that he sang coro on the rest of the songs. Aww. You know, and that's like how humble of a guy he was too. And I'd like to give a shout out to Nenge Hernandez right now, who's watching this, who's like a great, great long time friend who was part of that King King Descarga night with me. And he's one of the people that helped they help form me and, and inform me and nurture me to become uh, the, the skilled as I needed to be to be able to make something like this. So I, I, I give a great thank you and gratitude to you, Nenge. You know, and I've got friends here watching, like my friend John Brown is out there. We've known each other since we were in seventh grade. I've got Christina Christie out there. From Canada. <laughs> I got all these great friends that come together we all come together about this kind do of music. do there any of them have any questions for us any uh, questions uh, in there rocio is here congratulations from rocio ah rocio yes, rocio so is a wonderful you. woman she was the manager of Feove. in uh she took up, she started to manage him she was really great for fail we helped him to realize yeah. his dreams later and uh, she's just been the best. In fact, it really was when I went down there later when we re jump started the project. That's when I was able, when Rocio said, Matt, I have everything, all the letters, the photographs, it's all here. And, mm -hmm. and I went up and then I was able to put the pieces together and there were the pictures of he and Jose Antonio Mendez together and all the friends and the feel and the letters, the letters back and forth to his family, like even though he left Cuba in 55 and didn't return till 79, there was always, he was always in touch. And the letters were, were you know, I mean, there was a letter from his mother, sadly, that said, you know, we'll, we're waiting for you when you come home, we're gonna throw you a big party. That was in 57, yeah. he didn't go back till 79. And yeah. when he did, and when he did, she was just so excited to see him that she got drunk and passed out early and they had to put her to bed. I know. <laughs> and and, and yeah, know. that's in the film we talked about that. But you know, um, yeah, Rocio really, I remember we were up in, the, in that dusty, she, everything were, it was in boxes, all of his old things. And it was the stuff I had asked Feo before when we were, when Joey was making the record with him, I said, and, and, and here it all was. And I thought to myself, my God, if I'd had this earlier, it might, this, this, well, this film would have taken a different journey. Maybe, you know, we would have started it even a little bit earlier, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I gotta say the, the main question, and this is coming from uh, yes. my friend Rosemary Orozco, Lily Dominguez, Adeline Ferro. Omar right. Godoy is here with us. I don't know. He's a guy who was one of people who really championed vintage Cuban music in LA. I know this. Um, yes. They're all wondering, when is the record coming out? When is the film coming out? And it's a loaded yeah. question. I'll take I'll leave the record to you. And the movie to you if you might have to, you might have some information I don't have. 
Well, I heard that you guys are going to be heading now to is in Mexico for your next presentation of uh, in another f uh, festival or another in Tamaulipas, is it? Or yeah, no, in, in Morelia. Morelia. The Morelia okay. Film Festival. And it's going to be. Uh, it's going to have its Mexico premiere there. It, it's one of the best. It's probably the best festival in Latin America. One of the best, if not the best. Uh, film. I'm very excited about it. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go because I'll be filming and and with the current situation with the COVID uh, quarantining and insurance, I won't be able to 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 get there. But I will uh, be there in spirit because I can say that in San Sebastian, I only wish Joey was able to make it. It was really hard though to get anybody there, you know. But we did have a. It was in a beautiful old theater. And it was quite emotional to uh, wow. to be presenting the film because I think that Feovi's heart comes through, you know, his soul comes through. He's such a beautiful, beautiful uh, singer, and uh, and it was great. It was great to have uh, to finish the to finish the film, you know, and ha and present it there like that. So I think it's it's all good from here. I'm I'm really excited about it, Joey. You know, I, w the film, we wouldn't have made this film. This film wouldn't have happened if Joey didn't take it upon himself to tr to go find Feove and make this record. So thank you, Joey. Thank you. I mean, it's a great pleasure. It's really a, been one of the most significant moments of my life is to have a friendship with this guy whose record, you know, uh, it just it was a big game changer when I found this music and to have a friendship with him, but then also to be able to not just play music with him, but to create music with him. It was a profound experience, very humbling experience to see what a real person this guy was. I mean, wow, you know, you, you, you'd you be lucky to meet someone like this in your lifetime. He was that rare of an individual. And as far as a subject for a documentary, um, there are a lot of great artists but there's very rarely do you get somebody with a personality like that. So that was real. That, that nah, was really a gift, you know? Yeah, they don't make show people like this anymore. This is the level of Sammy Davis Jr. And, you know, and James Brown and Cap Capital all put into one. I mean, it's that level. You don't get that organic thing. If you do, we don't find out about it. I'm sure it's there, somewhere, but we don't find out about it because it's not made into a prefab packaging version of it. But, um, you know, I would like to say, you know. I'm sorry, Vivian. You're such a well-rounded person because you're here you have an innovator, a pioneer, someone who's fearless about what he's doing. He's so young, even at 77, when you guys recorded, I mean, he's fresh with ideas because you guys allowed him to fly and to yeah. be at, like his eyes were sparkling. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice, everything. And at the same time, a humble person. Uh, I mean, he doesn't, I guess he didn't, maybe he didn't realize how big he was or he doesn't, didn't matter because he just, had this big oh, heart. He knew he, he knew he was great. And, <laughs> and, and I, I mean that in a good way. I mean, I think <laughs> you to be that he knew he was great, but I think he also, there's a part of, you know, I think an artist, you know, uh, artist life sometimes. I mean, I don't think he had any question about his ability and his talent, but sometimes, you know, he needed, he needed Joey. He needed a Joey, you know? He's, he's a great performer, and he says it in the film. He said, you know, and Nando Alvarice was a DJ here in New York, was interviewing him on a radio, and he's in his 70s, like he's in his late 70s, and he said, you still think you have something? And he said, yeah, I just need the right people around me. And Joey happened to be that guy, and the, the young musicians that Joey brought along with him, and, and he needed that, you know? He wasn't uh he didn't want direction. That's the thing. It does, you know, like anyone who's a sensible artist, no matter how uh, much they excel and they develop, they want to know, well, what what am I supposed to be doing here? Give me some direction so I'll know what to do, what tool to pull out of the box, if you will. Um, just to circle back around real quick, like the film is now being shopped to be for a distribution or a platform. Well, I don't like that word. It's out there. Okay. We it's gave birth to the film. 
in the okay. land in the right home, man. We're not it's, shopping anymore. Yeah, okay. You know, someone someone's out there is looking out after us, and the same with the 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 record. The record will come out in all due time, and it'll be Absolutely. coming out coordinated with with each other. You know, so. Well, the record's great, and and uh, there's so much, you know, that was there's so much spontaneity in it, and even the fact, like Joey, years before the record, introduced me to a guy named Chocolate Armenteros, mm -hmm. and Joey had worked with him before, and when we were making, when Joey was making the record, and I was there trying to stay out of the way, which I didn't do a very good job of, uh, <laughs> I decided to really mix things up and i said you know what joey was very fond of chocolate and chocolate was very very fond of joey and they had a very they had a really good friendship and so i contacted chocolate and he said i want to bring you down as a birthday present for, for joey you know but we're not going to say anything you know and <laughs> joey was i mean you were thrilled to see him but you had to like you had to fit chocolate, and that's yeah. not necessarily an easy thing to do. I mean, it was a it was a quality problem. Yeah, it was a quality problem. I mean, I had already made arrangements for a specific number of instruments to play, put all together. So I had to figure out, well, what, how could I fit him in? And we we did a few songs together, and ended up with an extra one. And here's something I I want to talk about my friendship with him because there's a record behind you, and that is Freddie. That record behind you isn't that record behind you. Is it Freddie? The, the record album behind you, Vivian. This one. I'm just looking at some of the comments. My apologies. Yeah, Freddie. Exactly. It's, it's Freddie. Can you show us this? Can you show us this album? Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, Chocolate gave me his album of Freddie. Freddie was a female. Yeah, singer. very, very rare. Very special. Okay, this one. She was an outstanding female vocalist who was not famous what she was a domestic chocolate they told me she was the cleaning woman at the club Correct. and that she used to sit in with the band was it at the tropicana chocolate was the trumpeter in bebo valdez's orchestra at the tropicana for seven years from 1950 to 1957 he would work seven days a week seven weeks in a row all night go out every night afterwards and do after hours jam session and party to like 10 in the morning, sleep all day and start the whole thing again, seven days a week for seven weeks in a row and take one week vacation to recuperate. And okay, this is what he told me. And he said, this woman, Freddie, that George Raft discovered her and he thanked George her. Raft. George Raft who played the gangsters in the movies the guy that was always flipping the, the coin, who's famous, that's his thing. He was uh, like a doorman, it, was it Tropicana? It was, he was famous for being involved yeah. in- With the mob and everything, and, and in movies, yeah. Yes, but I mean, he was in Cuba at the time and he bankrolled that record and Chocolate gave me a bunch of his albums and that so, was one of Vivian, when did, Freddie, when did she die? She died young. She only made the one record. Right? 32 or 34 years old. In fact, you know, my father worked with Humberto Suarez, who, as you know, oh, was the director who, who put together the album for her. And he really? Was in Puerto Rico, where, where he worked with my father back in 62, 60, no, 63, 64. And he told my dad that because Freddie had no, you know, uh, professional or musical background, it was hard to really guide her as far as having the big band that you use. However, she had, she was this raw, you know, diamond in the raw that he said, she's just amazing. I want to record her. And he was, he, that's why, he, you know, he brought her down to record. And as you know, that was the only thing that she ever recorded. And then she passed away about 30, wow. 30 35 years old. Wow. It's a very obscure record too. It's kind of, yeah. you know, a very odd record. Because but, when we found it, we were like, who is this? You know, but did Chocolate play on that record? Yeah. So oh, yeah. it's <laughs> almost like there's nothing that Chocolate or no one that Chocolate didn't play with. Practically nothing. Because I mean, really, he, he, he played with Sexteto Habanero. We can even say that. It was a later yeah. 
incarnation of the band yeah. at Marte Bellona, the dance hall. But he I did mean, play with everybody. And yet yeah. he had never recorded with Feove. And yeah. so them coming together and when when I spoke to him, he said, Yeah, I met Feove in the late forties the first time. And he was just a kid. You know, uh Chocolate who arrived in Havana with his horn. Mm-hmm. And uh and he hung out at the Musicians Union, and he met all these people. And Feove was among them. Right. And uh, and uh, but he he himself his his story is one of uh, well he of, like well, he left Louis as well. Yeah. They he came they, to New York. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the people consider him to be like the Louis Armstrong of Cuba. And you know, he along with so many of these musicians that were in the big band. Uh, the Peña Alves brothers on the saxophones and El Negro Vivar. And Brother, they were like the guys that were called on all of those albums, like the Wrecking Crew in, in America or something. They were all, they were all yeah. uh, right, uh, uh, the, the trombone player. Uh, trombone. Oh, yeah, so yes, yes, yeah. General. They were all. Right guys that were on in those big bands and the big bands were extraordinary. Oh, Guillermo Barreto, they were all the the, and of course the big on these albums, tons of albums. Yeah, Alfredo de los Reyes. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then you hear them on the Descarga albums and like they're really showcased in what they can do that they, they have to keep kind of pulled back on those big band albums because every part is a very specific thing. It takes surgical precision to execute. All of these people were like the top, top of their game. I mean, I can't even imagine what it must have been like to hear the, them play all together in a large band together. Oh, I mean, really. So uh, there's a big story here, you know. There is a big story. And I want to say just, uh, you know, one thing, and it was really, that's one of the things about making this film that, Mm-hmm. I interviewed so many people. I interviewed about 65 different people, a lot of them very old. I interviewed even people like Cesar Portillo de la Luz, you know, and uh, he, and he died four days after I interviewed him. And oh, there's wow. so much material there. And it, it, it's not going to, it's important for posterity. There were a lot of things, you know, uh, for example, I spoke to uh Luis Miranda, who's a conguero from Machito, mm-hmm. who's Cuban and Puerto Rican. Yeah. And he told me the story. His drum is on the record cover, on the Feove record cover. Oh. That's him in the picture there. That was the really? drum. Yeah, yeah, he played on, on a lot of those recordings with Feove in Mexico. But he told me about the story that I always known about Vigara, the great Cuban uh, uh, drum maker. He was the one to put the keys yeah. on, the, uh, on the conga drum. And it was Potato's idea. Potato had been in New York and he'd seen, you know, uh, kit drums, you know, uh, traps that had keys on them. He said, can we do that on a conga drum? He brought it to his drum maker. Tune the drum. Yeah, he tuned the drums. And that's, and, and, and so when he was on his way to Cuba, back to Cuba, Potato said, "Go see Vergara," and Vergara made him a pair of those of those drums. So, so and, and so, this is history, man. This is important stuff. I don't know if anybody's written about that, but that's an interesting thing. You know, Vergara was the Stradivarius of Cuban drums, mm-hmm. congas. You know, there's so much of this that is unwritten, and I was talking to Matt about this too because you know, fortunately, Matt has been able to have the one to have friendships with people like Rene Lopez, who's the historian right. since the 50s, a collector, and people like him have all of this unwritten, uh, tr- like I want to call it trivia for lack of better, not mm-hmm. lack of better term, but facts. He has so many facts, and I see this that he's given Matt so much that I was saying to Matt, you know, you should do a some Facebook lives or some YouTube videos where you're talking about specific yeah. records and who all the players are. You know, we call are. this we call this in the document in making document we call it inside baseball. Yeah, inside baseball. So there are people that are interested in factoids and information. And what I learned in putting this film together 
is that in order for people to absorb information and absorb facts and numbers and names and dates, it's all fine. They have to feel connected emotionally. Mm-hmm. They have to feel connected emotionally. If I feel something for affection and I feel an emotional connection with, with Feove and Joey and Jose Antonio Mendez and myself or whoever, we chocolate latte. You, you can then absorb all the data and all the information, but if you don't have that connection, it's for most people, it's going to go one, one ear and out the other, you know? And the beautiful thing about having, uh, you know, someone like Feove is that it's all there. He's a big, he's just heart, you know, and it just comes through and, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and I'd say that going back because when I was there with Joey, when he was making the record, I, I love this guy, Feobe, who was an incredible personality. And, but I didn't have much information on him. I didn't have much to go on. And, and, but the thing that I really loved was exploring this, this friendship, the friendships he had with, with both Jose Antonio Mendez and Nino Rivera, very important guys. They were two essential people in his life and his development as an artist. And, you know, that's an important thing. My friendship with Joey, the friendship with those guys, the friendship between those people. Friendship is the theme in this film, and that's really important for me. Other films, the thematic, the themes might be other things. It might be family, but this is about friendship. You know? It is. It is. Without a doubt. You know, and, and, and Matt and Joey were talking about many of the interviews that you did that would not be a that were not part of the film because of you know the, the sequence and the whole thing but this is material that you have in your hands for perhaps something in the future for example here i am i want to be sharing a couple of photos who we went to because i heard i heard that we had malena's husband uh stopping ah, by yeah. oh my god look at that so yeah. mm-hmm. um, malena and we were there when we were filming in her house um sharing also when uh, the albertico menendez when he was talking to uh He's, long- wearing, he's got Joey's shirt there, Joey. Remember that? Yeah. Right he borrowed my shirt. <laughs> I said, you know, my cameraman, I knew he was going to say something when he saw that shirt. He said, <laughs> Matt, that shirt, it's, it's just terrible with the lighting. And I said, uh, I knew this was going to happen. I said, Joey, do you have a shirt? Do you have a shirt? <laughs> <laughs> uh, shirt off my back. Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Hema Cordero. That was a beautiful oh, thing. Hema. Uh, Hema is a great feeling singer. And yes. um, when I spoke to her, I saw her playing downtown. Uh, she played a gig at this jazz club downtown. And mm-hmm. she spoke to me about Feobe that she remembered him in 1979 when he returned. And mm-hmm. nobody knew. Nobody in Cuba knew who he was. He left in 55, and now musical tastes had changed. They were new. They were into different types of music. And she was on a television program, and mm-hmm. Feobe was a guest, but nobody knew who he was. Only the, I mean, Chucho Valdez knew who he was. The older musicians knew who he was. But she didn't know. She was a young girl singing with a coro. And, and, uh, and then she said when he got up there and he started to do his thing, it was... It was like, oh, my God, who is this guy? You know, it was like they'd never mm-hmm. seen anything like it. And yet it did harken back. He was doing things that were distinctly Cuban and, and style. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that was beautiful. And we were able to do that interview when we were down in Miami with her, you know. And it was yeah. like a, a different generational thing to talk to to her about yeah. that. It was really great, you know. I remember, Matt, we ended up going to, uh, I was able to find uh, uh, Felipe Dulcide's daughter's house. Yes. Interview. This so, is a guy that you know, Joey, his music, right? I mean, it's very, what were you, I mean, it's kind of a feeling. His music was a kind of a jazzy feeling thing, wasn't it? Not sure. You know, you have his records, Joey. I know it. You like his stuff. I have I so many records, it's hard to keep. I know. Up. How do you spell his name? D U L Z as in zebra A I D E S. You have his records. Yeah. I think the He's surviving great. person from Dulzaides group is uh, El Flaco Padron. Um, Nelson El Flaco Padron, who also was part of Julio Gutierrez's band and He's probably wow. 
Please, okay, I got I got one for you out there. And if anybody can answer this, now we're going to get a little inside baseball. Oh, boy. All right. Conde, okay. Changuito, the the percussionist, uh -huh. said to me, Feove, yes. He said, Conde Amabile. There was a showman. He was more of a dancer. His name was Conde Amabile. And this is like Loki Bambia. It's like, did it exist or didn't? Did he exist or didn't he exist? He used to hang out at the... Uh, Changuito told me about him. He said he was an amazing showman and a dancer. And I love the name. The Kind Count was his name. Conde Amabile. So maybe... You know, what's great about doing these things is somebody will come out and say, Conde Amable was my cousin. I knew him, you know. No, I yeah. was going to come yeah. forward, you know. Wow. Let's see. Someone's asking. Let's see. Matt, how do you make that connection so more Americans can appreciate these artists? John Brown's asking. Well, Joey can answer that one. We quote Duke Ellington, right, Joey? There's only, mm -hmm. uh, what is it, Joey? Only good music. Good music. And bad music. <laughs> and... <laughs> I and guess, but like that's also the Cuban music is great like, music. Some people think that you know the jackhammers outside is is makes them happy. Uh, what emotional experience do you relate to a noise? Okay, for me, Cuban music uh, that we like, right? Well, mambo, yeah. guaracha, cha cha cha. You know, yeah. bolero. This music is not. It's not world music. It is music of the world. It is. It's not some kind of odd ethnic music. This is a music that was like like when the mambo took off in Mexico, it was an explosion. It was born in, well, the roots are from Africa, but it took shape as a as a part of the uh, uh, of the danzón musically, right? But then it became a movement in Mexico, Paris mm -hmm. Prado and. And I spoke to uh, Robert Farris Thompson, the great historian in art, uh, you know, the guy, the, the expert really on the diaspora of African music. And he talked about being in Mexico City as a young man in 1950 mm -hmm. and hearing this on the, hearing the Guayo on the radio. The gong, king, gong, king, gong, king. And he was like, what is this? And he went down to the banquet hall in the, uh, in the hotel and he saw this orchestra playing and people were dancing and some danced the jitterbug and some danced, you know, they were doing different dances because it was so new, the mambo, that they hadn't figured out what the dance was yet. Like the people were just doing what they could. And he grabbed a hold of a waitress and he said, what am I listening to? And she screamed at him, mambo. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so this mambo thing took off and it spread throughout the world and we know what happened of course new york and the palladium the mambo was something special you know and in los angeles but then even in places like from the philippines to uh, throughout latin america throughout europe and france that it's something that became international in a way and i think that that is the crossover. I don't think of uh, of Afro-Cuban music as something that's some niche. I think it's really, it's, I mean, it's like rock and roll. It's like, uh, it's like jazz, you know, it's an, I mean, that's what one of the things Gilberto uh, uh, Zacaria said, he said, mm -hmm. they're so close together. I, I don't know where one begins and the other ends, you know, that jazz and Cuban music were born okay. together. It's well, the same. Also, yeah, I mean, of course, Rosemary, once again, she said, Yoruba beats from Africa, you know, let's not forget <laughs> Mother Earth here and Mother Africa. Mm -hmm. Thank you for mentioning that. And like, yeah, I mean, how do you make the connection so more Americans, this is what John Brown, like I say, I've known John Brown since <clears throat> we were in seventh grade together and mm -hmm. something like that Facebook has brought us back together and Vivian, I, I met you through Facebook because somehow I saw you comment on something and I looked at who is this person who's involved in this music and I saw pictures of you and Candido and Cachao. Mm -hmm. and, uh, who is this person and this is how friendships happen and like yes. here we are and there's John Brown, he's asking like how, how can we help connect people and I think it's really about telling Joey, give him the list that you gave me years ago. 
Yeah, well, I mean, like I said. And like, go like, listen to it, know, man. You can start now, with Tito Puente, Cachao. Yeah. You start with the greats. Man. Right. I should put that in the in the the, the, uh, the you comments. Get, you so listen well. to that music, you're never going to turn, turn around. I tell you, let's just say the best thing you could do is go find that boxed set of Cuban Jam Session 5 records. Yes. They remastered it last year. It's on. I'm sure it's on Spotify. Yeah. I mean, good stuff, man. Someone yeah. asked me this question frequently. Sean Wheeler. I don't know whether he's still watching. He was asked asked me this a while back. Like, what would you recommend? Something good to get into Cuban music would be. I said that. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite one, Joey? I know mine. Well, okay. my favorite is like the. Dad, the Cachao Descarga. Mine is the Nino or, Rivera. Oh, well, you know, it's hard yeah. to say. You we listened to that record the first night we met, that Nino Rivera. We listened to that with the with the, the, the pink one. Yeah. It's a great record. It's incredible mm -hmm. stuff. You know, it's, honestly, it's the personal interest stories. You know, if you watch this film, I, just to kind of clarify to you, John, once you see this film, that's going to be the connection uh, for anybody who was Spanish speaking or non-Spanish speaking. They're going to see what this is about. Okay, I want to say to that, it was very important to me that the film was not just for people that are into that kind of music. And I'm pleased to, to say that, you know, it definitely uh, connects with women and men. And yes. Those that are like Joey and I were like, you know, music nerds. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm going to speak for me anyway. I'm a music nerd. And, and for those that don't know anything about it, you know, and I, and I think that's, that's what I wanted. And I wanted that more than anything else. And again, I go back to the emotional connection because mm -hmm. all the information and all the facts and all that stuff, it's all great, but it doesn't mean anything if you're not, if you don't connect with the people on an emotional level. And that's what you, I, you I fall in love to do. With yeah, you definitely fall in love with the story of this man, the story of all these other musicians. Like, can you say, you know, the story for you is a story of many other musicians. And then you fall in love with the fact that you guys, like you say, two Americans who fall in love with Cuban music uh, and this great friendship and how things evolved to, to do this. Maybe you were doing a documentary and then it ended up being like you're doing the album and you're covering that doc the through your documentary the music that is recorded and how it all evolves uh, so organically and I think people can really, really organically that. is a good word because it didn't come together. I mean, I didn't. Joey did this spontaneous thing to make a record. He's we mm -hmm. talked about me going down there and filming it, and it kind of came together like that, and then. In finding probably one of the more difficult things I've had to do in my professional life was to find mm -hmm. what this movie was, the story. I mean, I knew individually that it was some great stuff. Faiovi was a brilliant performer. Mm -hmm. The record these guys did was special. You know, the history of this stuff was really interesting. But finding that and finding out what this it's it didn't have these uh, it didn't have this uh, uh, it didn't have uh, say like a for example. Uh, an unsolved uh, mystery. It wasn't like a, it didn't have some sensationalistic kind of thing. It's it's a story that I think everybody can relate to. I think there's a lot of Feovis out there. I feel I'm one of them. I think Joey is, and I think because he was somebody who had this enormous gift, this enormous talent, and this incredible personality, and yet his success was marginal. You know, he, his name was El Gran Feovi. He wasn't that big. He wasn't right. that tall. He, he uh, and yet when he was performing and Joey can tell you better than anybody because he was there with him and they worked together in that way. He became that. It was like perfect when he was performing, well, it came yeah. to life. You know? Yeah, no, he was larger than life. And I'd also like to add here that, you know, I made this record in 1999 in uh, 21 years now. And the following summer, I brought Feobi to Los Angeles. And right. I started recording more songs that were to be the follow-up oh. record. I started creating more content. And uh, I also at the time Back had to a, the drawing board. a mambo orchestra. 
called Mamba Noir Orchestra. It was an 18-piece orchestra, four trumpets, five yeah. sax, four trombones, and Faove. I had a show, a big show at the Conga Room on Wilshire Boulevard, and Faove came and he sang uh, El Yoyo and San Jose and wow. uh, Chanchullo. I made a big band of yeah. Chanchullo, and Ernest Wranglin was the guitar player. So I had Ernest Wranglin, who's a genius of a guitar player, together with Faiovi in a big band, all live. But that Ernest Wranglin is a little inside baseball. Ernest Wranglin is a great know. guitar player. Yeah, right. in, what was, was he in that King Cole? Did he play with that King Cole? No, that's no. John Collins. But there's another guy. Played, Ernest yeah. Wranglin is 88 now, and he's had a he's the first guy to play the skank beat of the ska music and. Uh. In reggae since the 50s, largely responsible for the development of what became reggae music, but a whole separate career in jazz music, playing with people like Sonny Stitt, um, Monty mm -hmm. Alexander. He he was the mentor to Monty Alexander. So when you played with Fayo, when, when Fayo came down and played with you there, how many nights? Was it one night? or? Well, we did three different nights. We did the big band night where he and Ernest Wranglin were the guests in the orchestra. Then we did a separate Ernest Wranglin show wow. with a small group. Was Plaz Johnson, Johnson in there? Plaz Johnson, no, he was not in there, but it was like a six-piece band. And so Feove came up and sang with Ernest Wranglin show, and then I think Ernest Wranglin played with Faobe. Did a separate okay. small group show in the small room. I mean, we. Yeah, we, Joey's fantastic. I'm going to tell you, this guy I, I just mentioned, Plaz Johnson. You know, Joey's one of Joey's of heroes, if I may say, is is Mancini. Plaz Johnson and Plaz Johnson yeah. played the sax part in the Pink Panther. Yeah, Joey, it's perfect, Joey Altrui. Yeah. Plaz Johnson is a longtime friend. He's 89 now, and uh, he we've been working together since the early 90s. And he's played with – he was in the Wrecking Crew. He's played with practically everyone since the 50s, like Sarah Vaughn, uh, Eddie Cochran, and Gene Vincent, uh, the Beach Boys, no, Pet Sounds, Steely Dan, Linda Ronstadt, Nelson Riddle, Sinatra, Nat King Cole, like – all of these people, Mancini, the Pink Panther, all of these people. And yeah, to, uh, to have worked with them on so many different projects is another great person for me, you know, to have, it's an honor to call him a friend, but you know, it's been incredible to put people like that together. I did a recording session while, while Feove was in LA that had Ernest Wrangler and also mm -hmm. Alvin Kippen on the bass. Oh, great. You know, so, like, putting things together. And so I've got some extra things that are going to come out after the album that will be, like, the follow-ups. <laughs> yeah. So uh, lots of good things happening here, you know. Everyone's super looking forward to it. And, of course, beautiful comments keep coming up. Uh, we're so great pleased. Thank you, Holly, so much. Great, great, uh, great depths of knowledge and love for our Afro-Cuban and jazz music our life we have always appreciated his acting so this connection is awesome and joey is fabulous thank you dear Vivian maria uh love okay. balsola and holly thank you yes. thank you all <laughs> right well things coming up holly uh what is this in fact i gave him a book of old cuban songs he said he's saying that comment i don't know uh not sure if it's something for you guys. So there's all these beautiful comments and, and ideas for future. Uh, Matt, any of the, the material that you guys, or, or particularly in the one that you filmed, were you thinking of either a future project or uh, maybe donating that to somewhere that people can access it, like a library or collect? I mean, yeah. Well, the first thing is to get the this first one. We got to get this one yes. out there, you know. And uh, but of course it's all there for 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 the future and I, it needs to be out there. So, you know there are so many so many stories here. I mean the Chocolate, Jose Antonio Mendez. These are all wonderful people. I spoke about uh, um, Robert Farris Thompson. You know he's writing a book on the Mambo, and he gave me a great interview. And I wasn't able to use it all, but uh, uh, you know. 
Did you say you interviewed 65 people for this? Yes. I think it was about 65 people. So you become wow. like a de facto expert of your own kind of like, you know, not really that I'm an expert, but you just end up talking to all of them. So you kind of, you know, figure stuff out. Uh, yeah. It was really a pleasure. You know, Leonardo Acosta is one of the great, uh, oh. Af one of the guys when it comes to Afro-Cuban jazz, he's probably the one of the most and he he passed away but he, he was so so authoritative and really great so it was a gift to be able to to talk to all these folks and you know i want to make sure that that the ones who uh that are still with us mm -hmm. you know that they get to see it because it has been a long time in the in the making and uh and uh and that's important yeah, right. to talk about this film, 20 years in the making. Uh, it was 77 when he was recording this. This is an album that we we're hoping that will be able to come out, you know, soon, maybe 2021. Let's see. And uh, there's the audience who are very excited about having the opportunity to enjoy El Gran Feyove. The Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. um, it's and, and our, wonderful. Our, of course, and I know that we'll have more opportunities to do uh, when we we'll do a radio show as well, because I have music uh, pre prepared to share, but there has been so much great conversation that I know that... Uh, <laughs> yeah, know. exactly. Where's the music? I, well, I have lots of it. <laughs> so you know, Let's go. Let's hear some you music know, now. I will recommend everyone to go either onto YouTube or Spotify or Pandora or some platform and just Look for Feove music right now just to get yourself in the mood and see what we're talking about, hear what we're talking about. For those of you who, who don't know his music, go and look for the Cuban Jam Session albums. Go listen to Feove. It's his All birthday. Right. Seven happy birthday, Feove. Yeah, happy birthday, yeah, Feove. Good night, guys. Great who you were and who you are and your spirit is here. And you know, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Viviama. I, I deeply appreciate this, and everyone who's watching. It's great. Like, what a miracle we all we have here the technology to bring us together like this. So, all thanks. right, thanks, Vivian. Thank Good you night. so much, guys. Good night, guys. Good Good night. Night. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Good night. Wow. And my friends, uh, as we come to a few moments. Uh, of uh, this live, uh, Vivian Maria live. What a beautiful, beautiful conversation with Matt Dillon and uh, Joey Altruda, uh, who are uh, with us uh, to celebrate Fe what would have been Feyove's uh, 97th birthday, Francisco Feyove. And again, the documentary is called Just Like That, El Gran Feyove. That's the name that he was known for um, throughout his uh uh, artistic career as a soloist and uh, the documentary is highly highly recommend that again as you heard he's going to be heading over now to Mexico and we're hoping that that it will come over to the United States so we'll have an opportunity to watch it here in different festivals and in the future perhaps have also the chance to purchase it uh, so it's highly recommended directed by Matt Dillon uh, it has co-produced by Joey Altruda, who were my special guests this evening, has beautiful photography. Uh, I've been showing you some uh, uh, photos throughout the evening, um, every once in a while, of some of the making of the documentary, Jacobo Brown, who also was instrumental in taking some very specific photos of Feyove that, uh, in fact, I, I know in part of the documentary when uh, Feyove passed away, where his uh, uh, where he was la laying uh, el féretro, uh, the casket, mm -hmm. it had the beautiful black and white photo that Jacobo uh, did of him. Uh, again, the, the album is amazing. Uh, the documentary is highly, highly recommended. Uh, I hope that probably we'll have the, the chance to uh, have it uh, accessible for all of us to enjoy. I had the opportunity of really viewing it. And every time I watched it, every time I cried, and it's been like four or five times at least, or maybe six or seven times. So I know that all of you would love it. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we are approaching to the last few moments of uh, the live. Thank you so much for all these beautiful messages. I mean, as I've been presenting some of them on screen, in fact, one time when they were asking me about one of the albums, I was reading some of your special uh, messages here. So thank you for that. Let's put a few more before we conclude. 
Adeline writes, uh, thank you for this beautiful interview. So inspiring and spark to provoke. Um, happy birthday, El Gran Feyove. And thank you, Matt and Joey. Thank you mostly, Vivian, for being leader and an example. Thank you. Thank you. It's been 25 years for me, I know, <laughs> since I started in public radio uh, with uh, all this uh, importance about the history of Cuban music and Latin music and the new uh, generations also that have come through. For example, some of the ones who are members of uh, the the band of this recording, as I mentioned before, Celio Gonzalez Jr., Osmani Paredes, Miguel Valdez, uh, some of the younger ones also uh, who are there that we mentioned earlier, and of course the classics like Celio uh, Gonzalez, Feyove, Alfredo Chocolate Armenteros, my work throughout the years uh, with my programs with legendaries uh, such as Chico Farrell, um, uh, Cachao, Generoso Jimenez, uh, also, wow, Juanito Marquez, who's still a legend. He's 91 years old and he's still part of our Miami community. Uh, Candido Camero, who will be 100 years old next uh, year, and we've worked tremendous times. Uh, Bobby Carcasses, as I mentioned before. Uh, so many, so many names that come to my mind that I've had the great honor of working with them. Some of them, obviously, because of, uh, I guess, my age and the time I started working have had passed on already. But uh, thankfully, through their music, their albums, their books, their legacy, the new generations is very important. And in the documentary, I know that Feyove mentions about the importance of bringing the younger generations and teaching them about the history, about the tradition, about the elders. They need to learn about that. So coming to new generations, uh, our children, our grandchildren, students, uh, young musicians, inspire them. Again, like Joey recommended having the Cuban Jam sessions. These are just the amazing five albums that I highly recommended of some of the top improvisers of the time period with Descargas. All of Joey's music, uh, if you can find it, you can, I, I, like I said, I had a lot of music to play for you, but you'll get music from Fejove from the 40s, the 50s. He even went on through this last recording that was done by Joel Truda and the musicians in 1999 and the additional material that we hope that will be released. So again, look for those, those music, Bebo Valdez, um, look for the classics, El Niño Rivera, if you want to learn more about this, Machito, uh, some of the rare albums, uh, or some of the singers like Celia Cruz. Um, yeah, I mentioned Juanito Marquez, of course, who's still with us, and he's an innovator. Juanito Marquez, not just an innovator in the guitar, from a transition to the acoustic to electric guitar. He was doing the Ritmo Paca, creator of a rhythm. He also was uh, doing arrangements for mega, mega orchestras uh, coming from a small town, you know, in, in Olguin. So all of these great uh, bands, and I see, for example, here in the chat, Oriente, that is a local band, uh, and they're also keeping alive Cuban music, and they're incorporating new rhythms to it, and they're adding a little bit other, uh, more upbeat, if you may, uh, perhaps, uh, how can we describe it? Oriente just blends Afro-Cuban with jazz and, and some rock. I mean, they do... Uh, a great fusion. So there's so much, so much that is co coming out of there. Um, uh, let's see, Holly's mentioning um, that uh, Le Chat Noir for the next time they pass through Miami. Yes, in fact, when when they came back then, uh, I had recommended all these clubs but because of the, record, the time for recording the documentary. Unfortunately, we were not even able to go and visit uh, Cristobal Diaz Ayala's um, uh, collection at FIU because um, the time was very short. So we ended up just going to see uh, Albertico Menendez, Gemma Corredera. We went to do the interview also with um, in, in Malena's house. So it was very short that weekend and Feyova had passed away just a few months. So he was running over to, to different travels. So I'm hoping that he'll come back and um, enjoy Le Chat Noir. That is uh, one of those small clubs that they're working so hard to keep not just jazz, but Latin jazz and other forms of music alive in this small, quaint, beautiful downtown location. So if you're in locally in Miami or if you're visiting, be sure to check them out at Chat Noir. They're listed in the chat as well. And I'm so happy uh, to see so many beautiful comments from uh, many folks here with us. So, so Tara, thank you so much. Um, I have my producer here. So just mm -hmm. wrapping things up for tonight. 
And my friends, as a final wrap up, thank you very much for being with us and uh, reminding you that I come to you. And this night was special. I didn't do my regular Cubanianda show, which I always bring to you every Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern time on 88.9 FM and worldwide. You can enjoy it at, at WDNA.org. And uh, because today is Feyove's birthday, would have been his 97th birthday, and I had my friends and special guests, Matt Dillon and Joel Truda, I did this Facebook Live, this uh, live with them. However, you can enjoy all this great music, the Feyove music, El Nino Rivera, the jam sessions, Freddy, Machito, Chico Farrell, uh, Cachao, Bebo, Generoso Jimenez, Oriente, so many of these bands. Uh, you can uh, enjoy all this beautiful music from yesteryears and new recordings like what Miguel Valdez is doing and what other people uh, are doing. Um, you can definitely enjoy it there on Cubaneando. So again, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. If you're listening online at WDNA.org. And I also I'll put it on the chat. You can enjoy Cubaneando 24 hours a day through Mixcloud. Dot com. So thank you to Willie, my producer, uh, my special guest this evening, and all of you who made us a very, very special celebration for Feyove and uh, for a night to be remembered. Good night and see you at the next Vivian Maria Live. Thanks again. Good night.